So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get going. Um, uh, we're going to be talking this afternoon about the confluence of big data and dynamic models, and then go step back further and talk about systems data science as an enterprise combination, wholesale combination, interweaving of data science and system science. I'm going to try to communicate to you some of the reasons I'm so enthusiastic, excited uh, about this combination, why I believe it offers such a profound potential. Following that, in a break, we'll, we'll be touching on characteristics of three major sources of data that will follow us through this boot camp. Those include search, volume data, time series of volume searches people do on certain terms or certain topics over time. Secondly, social media related data, particularly the exemplar we'll be using is tweets, Twitter data. And finally, smartphone-based data. Taking advantage of this unique feature of smartphones and wearables, I should say, in that they straddle the electronic world and the physical world, gathering evidence from both worlds. And that evidence in both those worlds gives us often a lot of hints as to underlying health behaviors, exposures, knowledge, attitudes, beliefs. But at the same time, they shape those health behaviors, exposures, knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs, um, often in profound ways. Um, so those two worlds both reflect, they're both a shadow, a digital shadow of our situation and the external physical world but they also shape um, that evolution of, of our situation in the world um, through electronic messaging, for example, and, and norms and, and attitudes spread online, etc. So um, the lenses we use to understand ourselves in the electronic world and the physical world. So we're going to see um, uh, how smartphones and wearables um, play a potent uh, data source, uh, serve as a potent data source. And then we're going to, in the closing hour, we're going to be hearing a case study focused on Twitter and tweet classification, um, which uh, aims to show how we can use machine learning methods together with big data to give us a source of evidence in the form of time series related to, um, uh, to, to references to cases of influenza online. Okay, so um, within this first talk, I'm going to be talking about uh, the confluence of big data on the one hand and dynamic model on the other. Um, I'd like to subtitle this talk, Moving Beyond Myth and Madness, with a reference to a quote from epidemiologist Phil Zuckerman um, to the effect that modeling without evidence or data is myth, and evidence and data without models are madness. Um, and we'll see today some ways of bringing together dynamic models and this data jointly can provide us a way to, to move beyond myth and madness and um, to better understand uh, the world around us and better understand its potential evolution, even in the event of intervention. So. Before lunch, before your um, sleep-inducing um, uh, uh, nutrition intake, um, you may recall that we discussed uh, simulation models. And I situated that discussion of simulation models purposefully uh, around this notion of models as learning tools. It'll be so critical for us this week. Um, you recall, may recall that late in that discussion, I characterized a bunch of different uses for simulation models. Um, uh, and uh, these uses um, show the multifaceted ways in which models can be used once built 
to inform our decision making, to help understand our prioritization of data to be collected, to, um, to serve as what-if tools to interpret evidence in a more reliable way, and to, to refine our, our mental models over time. But in the subsequent, whoa, in the subsequent talk, I also, um, I also talked about uh, the fact that there is a major barrier for building of these models to the degree that we are increasingly building models which depict detailed aspects of behavior, of, of individual behavior, whether it's you know, food, uh, food seeking behavior uh, for foodborne illness or for, uh, uh, for concerns about um, obesity related uh, chronic disease, uh, or whether it's aspects of e cigarette use and cigarette use, or whether it's aspects of contact behavior. Um, day to day and dynamic networks, which we've so, whose dynamics we've shown to be important for many conditions. Often we're dealing with a model that articulates theory at a level of specificity, a level of, of specificity with respect to certain types of behavior exposures um, and, and generative pathways that depend significantly on factors that are hard to evidence. For example, people's location in as much as it serves as an important mediator for their exposure to built environments, to their exposure to food environments, to their exposure to messaging environments, uh, or their exposure indeed to endocrine disrupting chemicals or, or contaminants. Important factor and one where self-reporting or depending on someone's home location often really doesn't measure up to understand their exposure to adverse environments or their access to resources. We often find there's quite a difference between where someone lives on the one hand and where their activity spaces take them in the course of the day, of their routine wanderings to school, to work, to shopping, to child care responsibilities, etc. Physical activity, another area where I argue that there's um, uh, a need, there's a need here to, to often represent um, an understanding of physical activity over time on the part of agents, say, in a model, based on their current location, their, their situated decision making about physical activity, but often a paucity of evidence, a limited set of evidence to inform, to ground that model, to cross-check its depiction of the situation and test does it, does it hold up in that crucible of empirical evidence. Same thing with spatial proximity as it might be a mediator for transmission of pathogen or of norms. Wade's models of, of, of great significance and note in childhood communicable disease have rather articulated characterizations of contact patterns mediated by space. But uh, the fact is that the studies that have been done on contact patterns within developed countries are often far and few between and uh, often uh, limited by their particular spatial context and by their resolution, for example, not being dynamic um, in, their, in their depiction. And, and so on. We could go on for, uh, for, for many features, including decision making, how people decide in different environments, different choices of behavior, physical activity, sedentary behavior, food intake, um, uh, aspects of social distancing, etc. And I argued before, absent an understanding of these behaviors and exposures, the ability to, to quantitatively tease apart um, policy trade-offs and the ability to really ground a model in rich data that, that really um, uh, keeps it honest in terms of, of, of helping it to serve as a learning tool is limited. Fortunately, I argued that uh, the advent of big data in the form of, of data in health that accords with the four Vs, the volume, velocity, variety, and veracity, offers a lot of benefits. And there's a, there's a complementarity, but more than that, there's a synergy here. 
Um, high velocity data can help us ground the models um, at many levels and inspire the models to a degree. Dynamic models can help make sense of that data, help us understand its distal implications, help us understand its implications for decision making um, on the intervention or policy front. So let's unpack that a little bit. Um, so grounding the models, well often this big data gives us high velocity observations. Observations that can be used to compare with model expectations. Um, we can compare the, the behaviors of simulated agents in the population and test to what degree it captures salient features of um, data collected from individuals that is longitudinal in character, um, temporally and locationally fine-grained. High-velocity data, as we'll see, can provide databases for parameterization and calibration of models to parameterize particular assumptions about models and to compare model outputs to in a way that, that uh, lends us a certain um, a confidence about undermeasured parameter values in as much as the model stays true to those uh, data that are, reflect emergent behavior of that model. Da uh, data in many cases can stimulate dynamic hypotheses. I, I'll show you data later in this boot camp from smartphones, for example, which shows dramatically different patterns for use of e-cigarettes from use of cigarettes um, when it comes to degree of exposure, suggesting uh, much greater levels of nicotine exposure and probably buildup of tolerance among cigarette smokers that motivates the use of models that can capture such patterns. Models that build on the foundational contributions of none other than Young and extends them with physiologic uh, underpinnings similar to what she has put into place in the diabetes sphere. Um, this data, critically, in as much as models are not brittle crystal balls, but rather are tools for learning, we learn, I argued in this morning's uh, introductory talk on dynamic models, one of the great successes of modeling is if we can find an inconsistency between what our model depicts according to our cherished understanding of what's probably going on in the world and what data suggests. And in as much as we can falsify a model or undercut a model's depiction, show that it's really off base, that it's, it's the, the logical consequences of our model as it captures our pet theory or our working hypothesis about the world, just don't jive with big patterns we see in the world. We've had, I argue that's not a failure of the model, but a success of modeling because we've advanced our understanding. And rich data, by pinning down the situation more, by pinning down, giving our models less wiggle room to be off and us not noticing, this can clue us in to, to uh, shortcomings in our model, which in short accelerates our learning. And finally, and, and we'll probably talk about this on Friday, in a remarkable remarkable type of contribution and opportunity. Using the tool of convergent cross-mapping, which is rooted in dynamical systems theory, we can use state-space reconstruction, <coughs> reconstruction of the, the state-space of the underlying system that gave rise to time series to assess whether there are causal connections between variables A and B, in what direction those causal connections go, A to B, B to A, or reciprocal or neither. And we can use that to assess the relative strength of those uh, linkages as well. So causal inference, using tools such as have been contributed by Lugia sitting there, um, uh, and by my student Bo Pu, not currently present, um, we can, we can use big data to clue us in to causal linkages, direct or indirect, between variables in the world that don't match what we have in the model. In other words, hint to us about needs for our model to add additional causal connections. Now, 
these are a lot of ways that high velocity data can ground the models. But the benefits, ladies and gentlemen, of this partnership, nay, this marriage, cut both ways. Um, it turns out that dynamic models can lend a great deal of strength to what we can deduce and how we go about measuring with big data. Okay. Um, I have to apologize. My normal wanderings, which I use for pedagogic purpose, are circumscribed by the fact that the audio is compromised by my very distance from the microphone. <laughs> so I've been urged to speak more loudly as I as I uh, wander from the microphone, microphone in my peripatetic fashion. Um, so if I speak loudly, it is not. It is. Uh, I do so not out of anger or vexation, but but to make myself clear in the recordings that that uh, will be produced. Um, so dynamic models, at a broad level, they help make sense of the data. Um, they can help us reason about regularities that underlie the sense of data. Models are all about positing underlying generative pathways, causal pathways. Um, that, that uh, we believe to uh, play a role within the system out there as a working hypothesis. Um, and by, by capturing that in the model, we can, we can try to bring to the question, why do we see certain patterns in the data that we collect using big data and, and through the data science lens? Critically, the models also offer the opportunity, by capturing a theory-based characterization of system causal pathways that we posit to be operating, and whose understanding we're testing over time, we can seek to understand how counterfactual situations, be it interventions or external, um, you know, external circumstance that's not yet been observed, a big downturn of the economy, you know, a, a wildly unhinged political leader coming into office, um, how that might affect, uh, might affect circumstances as depicted in the model. Um, and these counterfactuals uh, serve, reasoning about them serve as a critical role for planning for robust uh, policy plans, after all dealing with a wide variety of circumstances. But also, to the degree that one anticipates the outcome of an intervention that is shortly to be undertaken, perhaps selected it based on that understanding, and then you could examine how it actually plays out versus what the model's anticipating, can be a very, very powerful way of furthering the testing of the model. Models, as we'll see, uh, through the contributions of diverse people in the room, um, contributions of Wade and Lujia working with this model of, of, of hospital function, contributions of Xiao Yan, contributions of Chen Yang, um, Xiao Yan on diverse uh, childhood diseases, uh, Chen Yang also for, um, for mosquito uh, populations, um, with contributions from Olivia and from Zoru, um, have shown how models of the sort that we're talking about this boot camp can be used in a filtering technique. And I have to apologize, because the word filtering has come to carry many, almost a staggering load of baggage associated with it. We use filtering now to mean throwing out data, you know, filtering down a data set. When I'm talking filtering here, I'm talking about a process by which a model is over time regrounded in evidence where our understanding of what's going on in the situation is not merely influenced as time passes by what the model expects, but as new evidence arrives in the world, recognizing that, that the model's fallible and the data are fallible. The data have big error bars or uncertainties. It only relates to certain parts of the model. And the model's understanding is also limited. So we're going to see and a central goal of this boot camp, how filtering the form particle filtering and particle MCMC can, can further enhance our understanding of what's playing out in the world, can enhance our understanding of what's the underlying situation now, the state of the system now in a way that's 
constantly enriched by data coming in or recurrently enriched. We can use that to project forward how things might evolve absent intervention and indeed to examine the effects of intervention. Dynamic models also help us to understand the proximal and distal implications of observed behavior. If we see some behavior from the world, or if we collect data for a parameter in the model, a model can tell us, well, you know, uh, so what? Okay, so, we, so, so if, if data from uh, observations has given us a parameter value, maybe it's some aspect of contact duration, Models can help us tell us the significance of it by saying, okay, if we assume this contact duration versus that placeholder value we had earlier or an earlier estimate from the literature, what is the implication in terms of number of people getting infected, for example? What is the implication over time in terms of the effectiveness of, a, of an advisory or a school closure? So in short, the the logical implications, the, the follow-through implications, the entailed implications of, uh, of, of certain data collected from the world can be played out by a model because that goes into a piece of the model and the model can tell us the system-wide implications of those assumptions. Modeling can fill the gaps between simple uh, sample data points. It can help us posit what might be going on, why we see certain data at certain times, and account for what might be going on between those times. And critically, in a contribution that you will hear from none other than Winchell Chen, um, it can help identify sampling rates needed for reliable decision making using simulation models, um, the sampling rates that are required from our, our data collection. It turns out that in a remarkable set of examinations, he's shown that in many cases, ladies and gentlemen, let me cut to the chase. In many cases, the sort of data we collect from smartphones, from things such as social media, search data, um, et cetera, these high velocity data sources, what he's shown is that in some epidemiological contexts, um, that sort of data is not merely a nice to have, not merely a luxury, not merely a, you know, it enhances our models, but it's needed to make effective uh, estimates of health outcomes for that model, and by implications, effective decision making. In other words, there are quite a few contexts where if we don't collect data on dynamic contact patterns at the level of sub-hourly resolution, in other words, if we don't collect data every less, you know, more frequently than once an hour, we'll be totally misestimating how much disease spread in a population of communicable disease. And Winchell has systematically looked at that for uh, for about uh, ten different diseases or so. Okay, um, ten different pathogens. Uh, in various different networks and shown that it depends on, on the community uh, characteristics and network structure. And finally, and importantly, dynamic models serve as formidable tools for generating, ladies and gentlemen, synthetic data to test our data science pipelines and data science and our inference models and machine learning models that we use in the data science side. What I mean here is that we can use an agent-based model to produce data similar to what we gather from the world. We can use it to produce data, on, say, given a depiction and a simulation model. We could use it to, uh, to produce data on mobility patterns. Over time, GPS traces of how agents in the model are are, are moving, or we can use it to capture aspects of contact patterns over time. And, and report from the model using data series that are similar to what we observe from, say, a smartphone-based data collection system. And using that data, we can compare it with data from the world. We can, we can see, does it jibe with, model, with uh, comparable data from the wor world? We can also, test our inferencing 
using model model based mechanisms we can we can basically test excuse me test test data science classifiers for example or or tools for estimating entropy rate or tools for estimating the uh, uh, the underlying um, uh, status, health status of a person. And we do a lot of work with our group with these sort of model generated synthetic data to test our machine learning tools. And this synthetic data is valuable because it is labeled ground truth data. Synthetic ground truth? It's not, it's not real world observations with the real world situation known. Often that's very hard to get. But instead, it's synthetic generating data that captures many of the confounders and, and challenging features of the real world situation, but in the simulation model where the full situation is no. And we use that to see if our machine learning models can correctly infer, given data like we observe from the real world, whether they can infer through all of these surrounding challenges and confounders and and uh, aggregations and um, you know ecological observations whether they can infer the underlying situation so here models of this sort dynamic models can serve to test data science models and and test their effectiveness okay F help us it's not that the data from the model is correct but it can help us spot limitations blind spots and problems in the data science inference algorithm. It can help us spot where is the data science algorithm, under what conditions is it likely to be reliable, and under what conditions is it likely to, to, to uh, be risky or, or inaccurate. And we can do so in a very controlled way with the simulation, putting in different types of assumptions in the simulation that will test the machine learning models under different sorts of situations. So that's the idea of synthetic data, and as time allows in this boot camp, we will have time to explore that together. Now, I don't want to talk uh, in uh, detail about this, um, but I will just note a few features of this situation. Um, I have uh, successive slides, which I've shared with you, that you might want to look through in more detail, but I don't have time to go through them here together but I'd be glad to do so in coming days if there were interest. One aspect is simulating dynamic hypothesis. And, and the idea here, and, and I use a, a representative study that's just being expanded to, to 30 or 36 participants. This is work with Colleen Dell, uh, with uh, great contributions here from, um, from Jenna. And the idea here is, look, when we have interventions in this area or many other areas, often those interventions come to have effects of interest. Maybe it's, for example, they have an intervention pairing a, a veteran who's suffering a PTSD and struggle with, with opioid dependence, um, pairing them with a service, highly trained service dog, a dog that gets trained with them to recognize their signs of stress and intervene. And we're interested in how it ends up affecting perhaps levels of, of substance abuse, opioid use, or sense of well-being. Uh, or risk of suicidal ideation. Um, and one of the challenges here is, and uh, uh, as is true in a lot of real world situations, there are multifactorial, there are many, many different particular pathways by which this intervention might come to effect. Some might operate, for example, through sedentary behavior. The dog brings the veteran outside the house and engages, they have less option of just, you know, uh, spending time in a highly sedentary way because the dog has needs that need to be need to be addressed. Um, at the same time, perhaps it enhances moderate to vigorous physical activity, playing frisbee with the dog, or, or going running with the dog, or, or a brisk walk. Um, for some veterans, maybe a, a big feature. Um, in other cases, are in, 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 in many ways, may structure their life differently. The veteran can't be out at all hours and live a totally discombobulated life because the dog has to go out at many times. And so it forces a certain regularity or structure to their life um, that may be a far cry from what was in place earlier. It brings them into social contact with other people, brings them into social contact with the service dog community. Uh, it it uh, provides them with companionship directly through the dog. 
And when we consider an intervention like this, it has multifactorial different ways of impacting, say, these outcomes, suicidal ideation, opioid use, and risk of well-being. And if we want to understand for a given veteran which of these are operating, which of them have the, the biggest change associated with them as a result of the service dog, and which are, are less changed, with, with um, traditional measures, we can get kind of coarse-grained picture of this. Um, we depend on self-reporting on, um, you know, over the last quarter of the year, how often did you use opioids or your level, of, you might get aspects of physical health through a, a, an EMR, an electronic medical record, or a sense of well-being through, through quarterly self-report. Maybe some aspects of physical activity, you know, how often do you go out and engage in moderate vigorous physical activity with your dog or or, or aspects of sedentary behavior. But often, the difference between self-report and what can be picked up using physical measures, such as with smartphones and wearables, is profound. And, you know, if we start to couple these with sensors, uh, wearables, uh, such as Fitbits, such as the veterans in the study are wearing, or sensors um, on the phone that pick up aspects of location, social context, physical activity, distance to a beacon to discover how much time they're spending with their dog, a key mediator, how much time are they actually spending you know, together with the dog is a, is a very important factor and one would, where self-reporting might be uh, problematic accurately. It can give us a picture over time of what's going on. Um, it can give us a bit of a, bi a biography or history of the person. It can also fill in you know, just how much time are they spending before the dog's trained and after it's trained outside of the home? Or how much structure does their life have as quantified via entropy-based measures, predictability measures, which we've uh, done tons of work with with smartphone-based data? How much physical activity, vigorous physical activity or sedentary behavior? How much time are they spending with the dog or are they in contact with the other members of the service dog community? Now we can start, and how much sleep are they getting with Fitbit? Now we can start to probe, not, not in a way that immediately clues us in to the causal operation of the whole system, but it gives more of a sense of what's going on at different pieces of the system that might piece together some, some, some theories, right? Um, it might allow us to theorize. And this is stimulating dynamic hypotheses. By seeing what's going on, we might come to some better understanding about just how this intervention is, is impacting different individuals in a way that we might then compare with a model, with a model's expectations. It also gives you this picture. You recall similar pictures in the past where you know, we might be looking at aspects of, uh, for example, flashbacks on the part of an individual and we look at when the dogs interrupt the flashback episodes, when that individual got moderate to vigorous physical activity, aspects of social engagement. It gives us some linked portrait of the story of this person as they were exposed to greater levels of trained service dog and um, following the training, um, and degrees, how it relates to degree of sedentary behavior. This provides a high velocity, high variety, high veracity, and high volume portrait of the situation. Yes, so Olivia. How do I determine for the um, time spent with, with the dog and the, their mental health, how do we determine it's not a correlation but a causation? For example, if a person has a good mental health, he's likely to spend more time with the yeah. dog. So this is a good question. And there are ways that we talk about late in this boot camp involving CCM, convergent cross mapping. Um, which uh, provide theoretically grounded ways of doing exactly that, of testing the, the existence, the direction, and the strength of a connection between one variable, say here time, you know, encounters with dog or time with dog on a daily basis, and secondly, aspects of well-being, substance use, or other outcomes. Um, and those techniques I will present a theory for them about why they work. They will help you appreciate it, but they are based in complexity science and system science. And we've applied them very successfully in certain types of analyses to identify causal linkages between factors in time series of observational data. But it requires longer time series, like ideally thousands of records, um, 
and uh, uh, contemporaneous time series on, on, on different factors. So almost by definition, it requires uh, either very long time frames or high velocity data. Um, and we'll see how we can do that. My observations here was more towards stimulating dynamic hypotheses. We will be probing some aspects of causal linkages, and that's a more sophisticated um, undertaking that's uh, not yet something we're immediately doing. But it is something where uh, we can start to build some understanding of how does the dog affect things for different veterans, and at least how associationally is that associated with, with outcomes. And that can get us starting to theorize about the causal drivers without necessarily being able to show definitively that one is operating or not. With CCM techniques later, we might be able to probe things like that. Um, similarly, you know, if we consider a move of a family to a mixed from a poor neighborhood to a mixed income neighborhood, um, studies like the Moving Opportu to Opportunity Program in the US have shown that uh, when families were moved from a low-income neighborhood to a mixed-income neighborhood, um, in teenage girls, there were a set of positive outcomes for the girls who were in the families which were moved. Lower obesity levels, lower risk of pro-criminal involvement, so lower arrest rates, I believe was the measure, um, higher school performance, and a higher levels of high school graduation. I believe that with all three of those were significant. Um, and interestingly, for teenage boys, there was no statistically significant change in the obesity levels and worse outcomes for pro-criminal pro involvement. I can't remember for high school boys. I, 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 there was, I don't think there was any significant improvement in high school graduation rates. I can't remember if there was a, an adverse outcome. But it was adverse in pro-criminal involvement. And the natural question, of course, is why? Why do we see these outcomes? And once again, we're faced with the multifactorial nature of complex systems. This is a complex system. There are multiple pathways of influence, and I would argue even some feedbacks that I haven't fully explicated here. Um, with girls, various hypotheses have been raised. Um, maybe the girls are able to, in the new neighborhoods, they can spend more time outside because it's viewed as safer. It's a, they can spend more time outside in the evenings and, and during other hours because of the greater perceived safety. Uh, and maybe that allows greater moderate to vigorous physical activity. Um, some have argued maybe it's an issue of walkability. The new environments have better sidewalks and, and, and are easy to navigate on foot. So maybe there's less sedentary behavior going on and maybe some moderate vigorous physical activity. Others have argued, no, wait a minute, um, maybe, maybe that obesity improvement relates healthy food availability. In these new neighborhoods, the family can acquire food of higher quality through through supermarkets, uh, chains offering fresh fruits and vegetables rather than convenience stores. Um, so maybe the primary pathway is for food availability. Others point to recreational space availability. Um, the, the existence of more ball courts and, and recreational spaces. Um, the problem is, of course, if we were to ask the girls once a year, or once every six months, as I think was the protocol, how often did your family go food shopping at supermarkets as compared to convenience stores? Or to what degree, um, to what degree did you go out walking? Or, or how often were you out at night? Or, or to what degree did you make use of recreational space? We're depending on a lot of pretty sketchy self-reporting self and recall, and recall bias, trying to aggregate up over all these experiences over the past six months how often I did those things is hard. Um, there are also some who argue, incidentally, that the girls are spending more time at home eating, cooking from home rather than eating out at restaurants. And once again, asking how often do you eat out at restaurants, recall bias is hard, and it's not clear you'll get really reliable results. With something like smartphones or wearables, we can start to fill in these pictures. We can start to look how often are they spending eating at home. If we have GPS, and we can ask questions. 
how often are they going for food in, in um, grocery stores? Um, to what degree are they out walking at, in the evening versus uh, are they uh, engaged in, in, in walking uh, as a whole or recreational spaces? Are they using the parks? We can start to look at these things and start to build up some theory as to why obesity has been changed. Now, moving beyond that to causal connections here is less fully problematic from the last, last one because there's actually a fair bit of theory, for example, relating to moderate, physical, moderate to vigorous physical activity, how it affects BMI, or healthiness of diet affects BMI. There's some theory we can draw into. But the point is we can better learn from the empirical evidence by enriching that empirical evidence. And this can stimulate theorizing in the form of a model that's more grounded, that's less speculative as to what's going on, and more grounded as to what's going on based on physical measures that are not subject to a lot of self-reporting uh, and, and very coarse-grained reporting that is subject to a lot of recall bias. Um, now, smartphones and other wearables can give far larger and temporarily fine-grained knowledge of outcomes, and they can track the degree to which boys, subject to uh, in accordance with the theory of those who have supervised who have studied why they think pro-criminal involvement was higher in teenage boys, um, people pause that they're going back to the old neighborhood. Well, are they? Smartphones will tell you. Um, with a consenting individual, they'll tell where they're spending their time, etc. So I will note that learning from these measurements can be greatly enhanced. If you have a model for this, for how families might be adapting to the new environment, say an agent-based model that's situated in a certain region, or if we were to do so with a, with a study with service dogs. By comparing what we get from the smartphones to what we get from the model, we can find there's less wiggle room for it to be off. Not only are we dealing with broad outcomes like obesity over time, we can pin it down to certain pathways where we have evidence what the model suggests along those pathways, and what the data suggests. In short, we can more quickly test our model in that crucible of empirical evidence, of which I spoke earlier, where it's, a six, it's not a failure, of model, a failure of the model if the model fails to match empirical data, but a success of modeling if we can use that to then improve our thinking in the model. So this is some, uh, a way in which more rich data of this sort can test our model's assumptions more rigorously, more completely, and with less wiggle room than if we are depending only on self-report and coarse grain self-report on that. Okay, um, uh, I would note that uh, this is particularly strong type of um, uh, strength of understanding if we can undertake it prospectively for interventions, if we can observe what the model expects for an intervention outcome versus what's observed. Um, we can often test the model's expectations in a way that can, can better uh, and, and make it less, more robust and less subject to distortion. In other cases, we're providing databases for um, uh, parameterization calibration. This from uh, the foodborne illness study I mentioned with Cheryl Waldner. Um, uh, one of the best studies that's been done with Ethica, arguably uh, the the single best published study um, of Ethica's use. Uh, and here, individuals were self-reporting when they um, felt ill um, and characterized the symptoms um, and whether they saw uh, a uh, clinician uh, for, for that illness. Uh, traditional measures might pick up a, a, sub, a small subset of cases and some broad information, but data from smartphones might pick up a broader set of information involving, allowing us to pin down, as Cheryl has done together with Patrick, uh, her student, more clearly what the accuracy is of people's ability to recall what they ate over different, over different periods of time. How much time, for example, uh, people spent uh, getting fruit at vendors versus eating at home. To what degree, this is clinical and subclinical, I, I stand to be, stand to be whipped. Um, uh, so, so these are illnesses that did not yield presentation in those that did. Um, and um, 
I'll, I'll have to go get a wet noodle after this. Um, so data of this sort can then parameterize a model in important ways. For example, knowing how many, oh man, okay, now I add insult to entry. Oh, so um, uh, data of this sort can lead us to understand how many lead to clinical presentation and how many not, for example, here. Um, within our model. They can pin down model assumptions about how much care CQM people engage in, the duration of symptoms um, that people might report, and give us some understanding of the burden of healthcare uh, of, of foodborne illness or possible foodborne illness that we could compare with model outcomes from the standpoint of calibration. Um, Another use of, of models that I'll, I'll be emphasizing a lot during this boot camp is regrounding a model in high velocity observations, whoa, um, via uh, this, these filtering techniques. And these are techniques that have been advanced to a, an art form by Xiao Yan, with great contributions from um, uh, from Yang with mosquitoes, uh, some good work by um, Rifat. Where is Rifat? Um, Rifat, uh, I think, has stepped out for the moment. By Rifat for suicide-related, uh, uh, um, uh, yes, for suicide-related ideation for uh, for Canada, etc. And the idea here is: look, um, uh, we have a model. It depicts, it posits some situation in the world. And we're going to reground that model as new evidence comes in so it learns from this evidence from the world. Learns in terms of parameter estimates and learns in terms of, of the underlying state of the system. So we're going from a situation where we have a model, we project out, and without a lot of work, we can't update that model's assumptions with new data, to a situation where we're regrounding the model as new observations come in. So we have an understanding of the current latent state of the system, and we can project forward. And the idea is similar to what you deal with routinely with weather reports. So people here will recognize that we all depend very importantly on climate, on meteorological models these days, in terms of understanding what the weather is going to be over the next week, right? And uh, right now, I can look at an estimate here for the weather for next week. I can read it. Okay, so say for Sunday, August 4th, we're expecting a high of 23 and a low of 10. Um, that's based on a quite sophisticated model. Mm -hmm. But it would be a fool's errand if I were to take that estimate, take it to the bank, and a week from now, I'll be counting on that exact estimate, oh, 23 degrees, 10 degrees. And I would say, this estimate is totally off. Why? Because we do a lot better than that with, with meteorological models. We're constantly updating this model with new data. So come Wednesday, the estimate of what's going to be obtaining next Sunday, the, the temperature that's in place, whether it's going to rain or not, is going to be much better than now. Next fr this coming Friday, um, we will have a better estimate yet for what's going on next Sunday. Next Saturday, if I'm planning to hold a picnic on Sunday, I will depend on that updated weather estimate, not some weather estimate from today, or not some weather estimate made January 1st. In short, our models with weather reports are constantly updated with new data. And it's not that they're not good models, it's just that there's all these factors that it can't predict reasonably. There are stochastic chance events and so on. We don't know. The models just aren't precise enough and factors are so stochastic with turbulence, etc., that we don't know which way a front will go exactly, etc. And as a result, we are constantly regrounding those models as good as they are with estimates from observed data, right? Ladies and gentlemen, be as if um, those, uh, those living in Saskatoon, you know your way from here to your home very, very well. But if you tried to walk that way from here to your home, or for those visiting from here to your hotel with your eyes closed, you'd end up in a bad way. You probably wouldn't make it. 
right? And it's not that you have a bad mental model necessarily. You may have a very, very honed mental model. But it's just there's enough stochastic factors, what street lights happen to be at, whether there's construction on a sidewalk, etc., that could end you up in a bad way. Instead, if you tried to walk with your, with, uh, well, if you walked with your eyes closed, you'd be in bad shape. If you instead peaked every 10 seconds, or every 30 seconds, or every minute where you are, you'd get home fine. Maybe a bit slower, but you'd get home fine. Um, you'd be extra cautious crossing that street, but you cross it at just the right time, etc. <laughs> so the idea here is we want to lend our models eyes. We want to give them a way of, of periodically getting a glimpse of what's going on in the world and regrouting their estimates much, ladies and gentlemen, as models meteorologically are grounded by incoming evidence. And this is the province of particle filtering and particle MCMC. Advanced with such impressive results by Sa Yan and uh, by uh, Zuru and by Olivia uh, this summer, uh, by, uh, by uh, Liu Jie, uh, and uh, contributed to uh, by additional parties such as Anahita. So the idea here is we're getting data in, the model gets corrected just like that meteorological data, the meteorological model as data comes in, and now we're here on Monday, and we want to project forward. We used all the data till now to ground our model projections and look forward. But when tomorrow rolls around, we'll use an updated model yet from the latest data, so on. As the, the data comes out, we will reground our model and update our estimates. So we'll look forward and forecast based on our current understanding of model state grounded by the observations till now. We'll use it to understand the current situation, the latent state of the model, the state of those stocks, S-E-I-R, the count of people who are infected or exposed or susceptible, or and uh, in any other latent state. And then looking forward, we might use it to project what we might expect over the next few days with, with lowering confidence the further out we go, and ask about counterfactuals. Um, so here, we could consider, just like with the GPS, the power of GPS systems. If you think about it, ladies and gentlemen, the power of GPS systems lies not in just providing you a way from, to get from A to B. Right? If, if we used our GPS to tell us how to get from where you're going to start your journey to your end, if you, if you got its plan, and you printed it out, it'll offer a little bit of value. It tells you where to turn and so on. But the problem is what? The problem is, is if you make a mistake somewhere, or if there's a blocked street because of construction, or if there's big traffic snarl you got to avoid, or any other number of different circumstances, you miss the exit. Now you're, as Christine would say, now you're hooped, right? Um, and. And instead, what we'd like is a system like a GPS, where if we make uh, miss that exit, it will start correcting. Right? It will say, get off at the next exit and you know, do this, and, and it will reroute us, right? If we avoid a street because of construction, it will be savvy to that and will direct us down you know, Albert Street instead of Pasqua Street in Regina or what have you. Um, uh, if we if we can't end up traveling uh, per the plan in the certain way, it will reroute us. In short, it updates its recommendations based on our situation. And ladies and gentlemen, that has what Sao Yan has accomplished using, using uh, the models with which she's worked. Um, so using these models to ask about intervention outcomes, having been informed by observations in the system till now, grounding our understanding of model parameters and grounding our understanding of the model state, particularly in PMCMC models. And what this gives us, and the significance of this is profound, ladies and gentlemen. What it gives us, moreover, is a situation where we can knit together 
particular measurements about a system um, that take place from certain pieces within the system. And even though we may only have measurements at one or two places, perhaps, for example, the number of new infections being reported, which relates to this piece, or maybe it's number of people who have recovered, for example. By taking observations of just those pieces, taking those observations together with the logic of the model structure, it illumines, it sheds light on what's going on, not just in those places, points from which particular measurements were taken. It illumines what's going on in different areas of the system that influence that. For example, upstream factors. It gives you a clue, just as much as if I saw a huge stream of people coming in from this door here, or if I saw a huge number of people going this way, between exposed and infectious, it tells me there must be a lot of susceptibles to account for that. If I saw a huge stream of people coming from this door, I can't see what's out there. I can't see what's going in the library, but I see such a huge stream of people, I said, there's probably a lot of people out there, you know, in, in that library foyer. Maybe, you know, Starbucks had a case of foodborne illness and they're, they're trying to run away or something, right? Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, no, it's a good sermon. So, don't let me dissuade you. Um, uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm saying is that the, between observations made over time, particularly time series, high velocity, like we get from, from uh, big data, together with model logic, the, the logic that we posit to link the broader system structure to these uh, to the points of observation. We actually can get a lot more out than just measurements in certain places. We start to understand what's going on elsewhere in the model um, that gives rise to this data that, that is driving it. And we've undertaken this with a wide variety of, of different diseases, many of them, many of them pioneered by Sal. Yeah. Uh, with UGF, for example, contributing chickenpox uh, models as well, as well as working on the PMCMC code base, Wade Emergency Room Department Times, Tina, um, uh, Tina associated with HIV immunology, um, uh, some criminal justice processes associated with remand, um, and H1N1 um, uh, modeling early on. Uh, so we have a wide variety of, others, of, of, of other components here on the left that we'll be hearing about, including uh, the mosquito dynamics pioneered by none other than Chin Yang. Indeed. Um, it turns out that these techniques with filtering work particularly well with high-velocity data. And I won't spoil a good story you'll be hearing later, but suffice it to say that when we have models that take more than one type of data source. Um, we need to think more broadly than the confines, the shackled confines in the health sciences of, of the hierarchy of evidence and the pyramid of, 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 of evidence, this immutable pyramid, where at the pinnacle lies randomized clinical trials as traditionally construed. We need to think more broadly because one of the things you learn in this sphere, in the health sphere, one of the things we've observed directly in published work from our, from our contributions um, is something that was noted in the late 1990s uh, when I wore a younger man's shoes uh, and I was doing work uh, at a basic level of bioinformatics. And what people noticed then was that um, while traditional biology and biochemistry have been organized around extremely meticulously conducted experiments, controlled under very tight, tight conditions um, to measure certain factors, increasingly bioinformatics was being, being uh, confronted with a, gener a new generation of evidence, things like microarray data that provided Massive amounts of data on gene expression over time, but in a lower quality fashion. And there was a real, a real struggle within the biochemistry and biology community as to how, to how to deal with this new generation of evidence. Some argued 
that they should welcome it, embrace it with a new generation of analytical approaches like machine learning approaches, uh, statistical learning approaches, such as uh, pioneered in the work of Tibur Shrani uh, and, uh, and other contributors in the late 90s and, and early 2000s. Others argued that it was contaminating um, the the very high quality evidence that was being gathered, it, it, that it came at the expense of, uh, of traditional evidence and the care with which it's taken. Fast forward 20 years, I no longer wear a younger man's shoes. Um, but that argument, that, that argument in, in, in biochemistry and biology and the incipient field of bioinformatics has been settled. That ship, ladies and gentlemen, has sailed. And where it came down was that these new types of data, they may be lower quality than traditional data sources, but they provide different and valuable information. And information at such quantities and set such levels of, of, uh, of capacity to, to double check things for, for consistency that they actually bring a lot of value to the table. They don't merely contaminate with dross, with lead, what would otherwise be the gold of, of well-conducted experiments. And so, ladies and gentlemen, bioinformatics has come to value both traditional data and, and these new high-volume data sources because they bring different information to the table. And by combining newer data sources of lower quality with traditional high quality data, you do not, you do not dilute down the quality at loss of, of, get, of, of um, quality of outcomes. Rather, you enhance the ability to effectively understand the system. And so it is with health, the health sciences. One, one of the things we found is that lower quality data, such as data from social media, or data from search volumes. When combined with more rigorous types of data like clinically confirmed or lab confirmed cases of something like influenza, if you combine in these extra data with it, while it is true that the clinical or lab confirmation confirmed data are more reliable, you can actually predict far, far better what's going to happen if you bring in the additional data sources as well because you're bringing in a different sort of data about a different part of the system. Of a system that's joined underneath the surface and you're informing our understanding of certain parts that would be under, um, under measured and, and uh, under understood. So we found that when it comes to predicting clinical cases, if you bring in social media data, it will enhance your ability to predict clinical cases compared if you just rely on that time series of clinical case data. It also enhances, for sure, your ability to predict number of searches for influenza, for example, to bring in the, the search data, say. But, but it also enhances our ability to predict clinical cases. Ladies and gentlemen, that ship is sailing. And don't be late in the health sciences. Um, okay, so what we see here is a prospect increasingly rich and built by um, those with exceptional skill in the infrastructural area, people like Lugia um, and people like uh, uh, Winchell. Uh, the prospects for streaming sources of data that bring in over time evidence from many different sources, from, from public sources such as Instagram and Tumblr, uh, such as Twitter, news mentions and weather related information, um, that bring in information from Google Trends on search data, that take that data, process it, sometimes turning large streams of tweets, of individual tweets into time series of tweets that that are, are fairly reliably, are seen as fairly reliably um, mentioning an actual case of influenza that's within the province. And turning those into time series that can then be used to, to inform a model. Much as every day our GPS system, or as we drive our GPS system is updated by ongoing GPS measurements, 
It has eyes to see the world, just like we would need them to peek as we walk home. And just like weather reports that are updated at least daily with new weather, weather data. So it is we can take streaming data, process it in various ways, ways being explored by people like Yuan Tian, like Zuru here, and like Liu Jie. Um, and we can then feed it into our models in ways that keep them always grounded and always honest in the sense of correcting their mistakes. So the key take home messages, ladies and gentlemen here. We argued before lunch that dynamic models ca capture dynamic hypotheses about processes underlying systems. And, and these are learning tools um, that can help speed, deepen, and enhance the reliability of our ability to learn from evidence. And models can help us understand how interventions might affect outcomes, even in counterfactual situations, because they capture the positive causality about the system. And it isn't the case that the model is necessarily true, but by representing it in a simplified way, we can more quickly spot the inconsistencies between what we think is going on in the world and what actually is, and correct our thinking and correct the model. So by putting it out there, um, we, more t we more quickly find truth through error than from confusion. We fail early, fail often. Put it out there, test it in the clear light of day, correct it, and correct it, hopefully, with a high velocity evidence. Electronically captured data is increasingly ubiquitous, and it shares the variety of velocity that, that accompanies dynamic models. Data that's a high velocity is dynamic data, and it's almost a perfect match, ladies and gentlemen, for dynamic models. Models can leverage this big data in multiple ways. I, I listed them quickly here. Enhancing theorizing about models. Uh, in a nod to, to uh, Olivia's question, uh, enhancing our ability to detect causal connections using tools like CCM. Providing databases for model parameterization, databases for model calibration, and allowing us to perform this filtering, this sort of correction of data where the model predicts forward and we correct it based on observations on a regular basis. And models can leverage some of the most powerful ways that models can, can enhance us is when reasoning about counterfactual interventions, where we compare model, model expectations to plan better interventions, having learned from what worked to what didn't work when moving those families to mixed income neighborhoods. Maybe they took advantage of the healthy foods, but they weren't using the ball courts more and weren't out at night as much walking. We might be able to better craft an intervention that can. Or in terms of uh, observing the effects of a service dog, we might design uh, an enhancement of the program, preparing veterans with service dogs that enhance their ability to uh, encourage the veteran to engage in uh, moderate to vigorous physical activity, because we see that hasn't been changed much. We can learn from interventions more effectively using high velocity data, especially by comparing what we would have expected with the models that we might have built on the same factor. And we can use that to plot better interventions by then simulating alternative intervention mechanisms in the models. We can also use it to test our models when we undertake a counterfactual intervention, what's expected in the model, and what to observe for the data. So grounding in big data, in some cases, seems to be essential for securing reliable findings. The, the scope of those cases is still being explored, but it's in able hands in the form of windshield. Okay. In machine learning methods, can provide multiple powerful ways to combine dynamic models and big data, such as that, those filtering techniques we're talking about. But as we'll see from this floor, as a new generation arrives in a few hours, many, just over an hour, we will see that actually we can use machine learning approaches along the pipeline. For example, Yuan will be presenting how we can use machine learning with tweets 
to arrive at classification of tweets that could then support a time series of tweets coming in over time that could leverage a remarkable infrastructure such as that put in place by Lugia to inform dynamic models over time through particle filtering and in the future particle MCMC. Okay. Um, okay, so those are some key take home messages about this encounter, I, dynamic um, dynamic modeling and big data. I'd like to answer any questions for this before we stop for a short health break. Any questions I can answer? Sure. No. Um, how often, like, how much data summarization or synthesis do you have to get to all this data before you can Great question. Um, I kind of hemmed and hawed about how much to include in that in the boot camp. And the, the truth is, for most of the data sources, there is between a moderate amount, a, a, at least a, a very modest amount, to a medium amount of uh, uh, data processing that's needed before it gets filtered into the model. I'll, I'll give a few examples, okay? Um, uh, these are not privileged, I'm just pulling them off the top of my head. Um, uh, let's suppose we're dealing with physical activity data. Physical activity data involves um, a tremendous amount of volume of information. Let's suppose we're dealing with step counts, okay? Step counts, um, well, if we're dealing with with, with uh, accelerometer data, there's a lot of aggregation we need to do because it's, you, you get it kind of spurts and, and as it turns out, the way it's measured on tools like our Ethica system, you know, it's measured every five minutes for one or two minutes and, and those have to be clumped together and, and we need to say something because physical activity does not stop between times when it's measured, you know. Um, and we need to, to often recognize that there's going to be some 30 second intervals where we may have a bunch of measurements, other times less, and, and, and deal with those vagaries. So often we'll bin it and take the average in a certain time, often apply a certain metric to it to say how much sort of activity does this mean, never go from, from accelerometry to that. And that, that involves some, some work. Um, I'll, I'll give another example. Um, uh, uh, take uh, step counts. So step counts are actually taken in a kind of curious way. It actually tells you, and this is Ethica, but it's Ethica because it's just passing on the information from iOS or from Android. It actually measures like over some duration of time, which varies from measurement to measurement, how many steps did you take? So it might be over this seven minute interval, you took no steps. And then over this 30 second interval, you took 20 steps. And over this 45 second interval, you took 30. And, and you know, you get the picture. It sort of um, captures these, these intervals that are, um, uh, that are mutually exclusive and, and gives you the amount of steps over that period of time. And to turn that into meaningful information, generally you also want to you know, bin it into regularly spaced intervals or reason about, okay, the density of these footsteps. Okay, it's, you know, maybe it's 10, but it's over 10 minutes. You know, that's a very low rate of walking compared to 10 over 10 seconds. And so you end up doing some processing to kind of render it into a form that's, that, that can inform the model. I'll give another example, um, network data. We've done a lot with, um, Maybe I'll bring those in. That would be fun. Alex, we'll have to find those beacons. Um, I have them right now. Oh, you do? Yeah. Good man. Um, I was wondering where they are. Um, you want to be done with them before I bring them in? Uh, yeah, we should set up the, um, uh, we should set up the lunch. Um, or that stuff, it's no food. <laughs> I guess you should. Um, <laughs> so so um, yeah, we should uh, we should set up a, a, a study. I'd like to talk with you afterwards as your situation allows. So um, so ladies and gentlemen, um, when it comes to contact data, 
Um, if I carry a beacon and you carry a beacon, Carol, um, I can detect when you're nearby, you can detect when I'm nearby, we can get rich contact pattern data out of that. And that's all nice and fine to say, but it, it turns out to identify it, we have to boil things down a bit. Like maybe my beacon, you see my beacon, but I don't see yours. Is that, is that a contact or not, right? Um, um, also, these beacon contacts occur at kind of intervals of time that are irregular. To what degree do we say I'm in contact with you for a duration? All I hear is the chirp of your beacon. You know, every every thirty seconds, every every couple minutes, sometimes, and I say they're Cheryl still. But how do I knit that together into a plausible dynamic network? Because it's most certainly not the case that between those chirps, um, that that I'm out of contact with you. I'm just as much in contact. It's just that. It's not in the province of the of the sensors involved and the protocols to continuously say, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. You know, it's just it, it's only an episodic thing. So and so clean the data and do a social network analysis first and use the result of the social network analysis. Correct. And Correct. And and generally you would you would sort of um, again end up a lot of it comes down to binning for some of these things you know you'd say during a 30 second interval did i see cheryl's beacon or during a minute wh whatever the appropriate amount of time based on the protocol and and maybe it's every five minutes because f guys this five minute duty cycle or um and and then i say okay i'm in i'm in proximity with cheryl at this distance for this amount of time and all those chirps i would have heard in that time i take the average of their signal strength to know how close to you you know, I am. And and then we boil that down, and then we might put that into a social network analysis software, um, or we might potentially feed it directly to Ethica, um, uh, as Winchell is known to do. It's break time. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's break time. Um, There's three croissants that are made if you wish to have them. Don't mind if I do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Christine. See you later. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Okay. Um, we are very fortunate. <laughs> you can't even imagine, Charles. <laughs> um, so uh, does that help answer your question? And it turns out that there's typically the good news about, so the bad news is there's some processing that's needed. The good news is it's the same processing for a lot of tasks. Like, it's turn the crank time. Time to make the croissants. You know, and and you turn the crank and it and it boils it down in the same way. It doesn't it's not really horrendous, you know, um, dealing with the vagaries of this data set or that one. Typically it's a fairly routine process for a lot of these things. Um, but um, for some it actually requires a machine learning model. I'll give you an example. You end oh, give some additional comments. Um, <laughs> um, so um, Yuan will give an example of how she used the machine learning model to take this big data, boil it down into reliable classifications of tweets as to whether they plausibly referred to influenza cases, you know, directly known to the person who sent the tweet. And then that can be used to form a time series of tweets. Um, so Zoru is doing something uh, somewhat similar with the opioid-related dimensions. Okay. Um, uh, that's actually a fair bit of, um, uh, you know, a, a fair bit of work to get that time series. But again, um, for a given type of classification, it's fairly replicable. Um, but it does require training a classifier. In a case of Tina, Tina Thomas, she's dealing with screen state data. So she's dealing with data: is the phone on or a screen on or off? And by implications, could they be using an app? or not. Um, and what she's doing is um, and to interpret that data. Because of the way that it's that it's put together, it turns out you actually need, like for you, and you need a, some sort of little machine learning model. It's a very simple hidden Markov model to deduce at any one time is the screen or on or off. Because Ethica will you know, measure something for a bit of time, and there'll be for, for four minutes, won't measure, and then, oh, actually, that's not true. It'll measure things at arbitrary intervals for screen state. But then sometimes Ethica, if the person's using 
a bunch of apps at once and they kick Ethica out for a few minutes and then it comes back. And so if you just deal with the raw data, you'll get weird things like screen turned on, you know, screen turning on, you might think, oh, that means it's on, but then you'll see two minutes later, screen turning on, and you say, wait a minute, something happened between those times, it must have turned off. Um, and her HMM can ferret that out, can estimate what's the underlying situation over time in one second intervals. And so there, there's a bit of a machine learning model that's classifying. In short, um, there's some processing that's needed, but it is fairly routine processing, because she can run her algorithm for any data, any study that requires screen state data, just about any study with screen state data could use her algorithm, turn the crank, and classify things at second intervals. Does that make sense? Yes, What me. you just described, is that like kind of data augmentation in machine learning? Yeah, I, I, I guess you could say that. It's, it, in a way, it's data imputation or augmentation. So it's filling in the blanks between some data and, and complementing what data you get directly with data that can be pieced together from it in a reliable, uh, in a quite reliable way, in a savvy way. So yeah, that's 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 a good way to think about it. Data imputation or data prediction, even for what's going on between those measurements and making sense when there's missing measurements. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Let's go somewhere. Okay. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Um, we will um, reconvene in 10 minutes. And um, we will um, talk about some additional aspects of the situation.